Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome back to the Prestige webinar series. My name is Melissa Inafo. I am the Client Success Specialist here at Prestige PEO, and I will continue to be your host this morning for the latest, the latest webinar that we have created just for you. So today, I am joined by special guest Larry Balin. He is the CEO of Single Throw Marketing. And today, Larry is going to be taking us through some of the marketing best practices that will boost your pipeline and engagement with leads. So it's gonna lead you to new customers. We're really excited about today's um, webinar and what we can bring you some new and exciting growth focused content. Um, so with that, let's check in with Larry. Hey, Larry, how you doing? I'm doing great, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you so much for joining with us today. And My I'm pleasure. Super Okay, um, obviously I've been talking about speed, not speed and me starting this presentation. So speed is a, is a major factor and I'm gonna get a jump right in. If anybody has any questions, they could um, use the QA section to just send it in and I'll do my best to answer the questions as we're, as we're moving forward or even after the fact. Um, so just to give you a little background, I'm a, a best-selling author on the topic of marketing, um, specifically, Digital marketing. Um, I'm a CEO of a fairly good sized, uh, fairly uh, large and 20 year old digital marketing firm located in New Jersey. Uh, we're also a, a Google partner. So we deal directly with Google and get a tremendous amount of data that's not typically available to the, to the business public. So a lot of this comes from uh, information that we've gathered from various clients, from things that we've done things that we see that work uh, from a conversion perspective, but also best practices globally from some of our partners like Google. And one of the things uh, that everyone tends to focus on is speed uh, when it comes to conversion. It's one of the, it's one of the first things that we look at uh, as an organization because you have about three seconds to, for your site to load before at least 50% of the people that come to the site will actually leave the website. And that's not three seconds on um, gig speed Wi-Fi. Uh, that's three seconds on a mobile device on the train, uh, three three gig, you know, three G. Uh, it needs to it needs to load very fast on various devices. Uh, it is really fifty three percent is the statistic that Google put out of visits that are abandoned if a mobile site takes longer than three seconds to load, and the average website takes sixteen seconds to load. So uh, taking a look at your website on your mobile device, turning off Wi-Fi, going somewhere where you maybe have one or two bars of strength and testing your website is, is, a, is a pretty big deal. Google also has, and there's a lot of them online, there's a lot of testing sites that you can test your load speeds, load times, and it starts to tell you what needs to be changed. Because uh, most people, when you're talking about generating leads and bringing people to your website, they're coming from a gigantic list of people that say they can help them you're in that list uh, hopefully you're on page one somewhere uh, and if you actually are fortunate enough to garner a click from somebody searching for the thing that you do uh, they're one back click away from a gigantic list of other people that say they can help them so they're just not going to wait there's no reason for them to wait they don't know you uh, they're looking for a service and their time is the most important thing to them so uh, a lot of things that have to do with uh, load times have to, images on, on a website, what loads first, what loads second. There's a lot of factors in there. So if the site doesn't load quickly and 53% of the people leave, conversion's an issue right off the bat. You're already 53% in the hole if those people leave because your site took four seconds, six seconds, 10 seconds, 30 seconds to load. So you're, you have fewer people that your website can actually convert unless we can get them to take that next click and not that back click. So load time is a very important factor. Um, if not one of the, the the biggest factors with Google's new algorithm as well. And just from a usability perspective, no one wants to wait for a website. So we want to talk about making connection and, and speed and engagement, first engagement, which is something that Google measures is what's the first, how long does it take for the first engagement uh, of a website? And if your first engagement is somebody hitting the back button, and going and searching for the same thing again, that's not a good engagement. So what is the first engagement? What are the, some of the early connections that can be made? 
Google also put out some interesting statistics of what that first connection looks like. So we, we already mentioned that 53% of people will leave if a site takes longer than, than three seconds to load. But for every search uh, in every industry, uh, no matter what it is, 50% of all searches uh, lead to zero clicks, meaning zero clicks to a website. Because if you look at the, the at Google, when you do a search, it's not the same Google home, uh, Google results page that it was 10 years ago, even five years ago. There's questions and answers. There's local search listings. If it's a if it's a local business, Google tends to believe that the thing closest to you may be the best thing um, uh, at solving the issue you have, depending on what you're searching for. There's the entire right sidebar. There's Google My Business, and typically your the first organic result is below the fold below the scroll line so people are going to your google my business listing and they're clicking uh click to call not even going to your website depending on if you've optimized that uh, and done everything that google allows you to do on that business listing which is uh, really important also measuring from a conversion perspective how many people engage with your engage with your brand before they get to your website so 50% of people will engage in your Google My Business page. They will engage with the, the questions that Google puts forward. Um, and hopefully you're the answer that shows up for those questions. So those are all things that we need to look at and understand that conversion can happen prior to anybody even getting to your website. So you have to look at that entire ecosystem of early connection as well as late connection. Um, Google My Business is Google's way now of learning what your business is about. Um, they don't use keywords. They haven't used keywords in decades, but um, they don't part of their algorithm to learn what you are and who you are and what you offer and who you best serve has a lot to do with your Google My Business page and optimizing that. Uh, think of it almost as a, as a business search uh, or a business social engine for, for lack of a better term. It has all the information about what category you're in, name of your company, locations, phone numbers, websites, reviews, posts, um, descriptions, uh, imagery, everything is located. It's kind of a little mini website within within Google. And it is, is important to take advantage of the 50% of people that are going to engage you there from a conversion perspective. So this, this would be uh, broken into three pieces. This or two pieces, um, this would be the Google My Business page for single throw marketing, my company. So what you can see there on the left hand side is pretty much the the entire layout uh, of what it is where you're going to have at the top of the page, which is what's in the middle. You have clicks to your website, directions to our location, people save or click to call. We actually track all of that. We, we, we classify all those things as conversions. Those are all conversion points. They're all touch points you have to think kind of pre and post uh beyond the sale and again if you're a service company like we are a sale or a conversion is is a lead uh it's someone making contact at that point for any company if you, if you hire a marketing firm to get you leads it's your job to obviously close the deals as long as you're getting qualified leads but we classify a conversion or at least one of our conversions as a lead so it lists what we are we're a marketing agency located in monmouth county new jersey uh, different service options, our address, hours of operation, when it was updated, and obviously during COVID, we have health and safety we we're uh, able to put in there that if there's an appointment required, if you come to our office, masks, the staff wear masks, temperature checks, so on and so forth. Um, there could be clicks uh, that are different than your website to set up an appointment, which would be a, yet another uh, conversion point. And everything, every single conversion point is tracked. So even if someone calls us from by clicking to the click to call within our Google My Business listing, we know it came from our Google My Business listing. Um, on the right hand side, you can even see products and services. There's a, those are posts. You have to start to look at this as a, almost, as I said earlier, a social platform, social property, where every seven days, uh, Google would like to see new content put. Um, on Google My Business. That's typically how long a post will last. So you can list your products, you can list your services, you can post here, you can update here, uh, you can list your social profiles. And this is one of the reasons, so when you Google the name of my company, this is typically what shows up, but, or also if you're in an area where Google believes we we are uh, have a strong presence, which is a lot of New Jersey, um, 
we actually might show up on the right hand side when someone's looking for a digital marketing agency. Um, also, reviews are a big piece of it as well. We want to make sure that we're getting reviews, that they're good reviews, that our happy clients are posting, so on and so forth. So there's a lot of information here that Google's putting forward, and people can even engage here by asking questions. Uh, you can send it to your phone. All, all of these things for our clients will actually let them know how many people requested directions, how many people saved their local listing, how many people clicked to go to their website from a local listing, and obviously the click to call. So we look to convert here for the people that will convert here. So, and these are typically people that know what they want. They've seen what enough here to say, okay, I think this is a company I want to contact. They don't even have to go to our website and we know half of them won't, yet they can still make contact. So that being said, calls to action are very, very important. Uh, you, you're gonna hear me mention that, uh, and you've been hearing me mention that throughout this webinar about Everything needs that call to action. It needs that next step. What do you expect from someone? What do you expect them to do? You can't really leave it up to them. Even on that Google My Business page, there's very clear calls to action in the right places, uh, which is important. A call to action is only strong if it can be found. So calls to action, uh, I like to describe them that uh, from a content perspective, there's a structure to calls to action. So if, if you've seen the movie um, classic Princess Bride, um, if you've seen it, you're probably smiling at this picture and you're familiar with the term, hello, my name is Anigo Montoya, you killed my father, prepare to die. But this is a, one of the best examples of uh, well-structured text that, is, that has everything a call to action needs in written text. Um, and, and I'll explain, there's four pieces to this statement that make it a great call to action. And it, if you follow these rules, you'll actually start to look at content a lot differently, content that's meant to actually persuade someone to do a thing, which this is. So the, the call to action here is, is part one is the greeting. Part two is an introduction. My name is in, in, Inigo Montoya. Part three is situational relevance. You killed my father. And then finally you have expectations. What can I expect? Well, you can expect to die. Th that is a very short sentence and it is very well structured from the perspective of it's easy to remember that you have to have those four pieces in everything that we do online. Every time we're, we're touching someone, this is what has to happen. It has to be relevant. And again, this is kind of a, a funny example, but it is a memorable example. And it is uh, a, a very uh, apropos for every kind of call to action there is, whether it be social, whether it be email, there has to be that greeting. People have to need to know who they're speaking to. So you have that introduction. There needs to be that situational relevance. Why is this statement relevant? Why is this button where it is relevant? Why is this choice relevant? And what can I expect next? So it's four pieces fit into every single call to action. And this is a great way to remember it. So call to action rules, they should be plentiful, um, especially on a website. On a, on a website, there's there's no reason that you shouldn't be as redundant as possible. Not everyone looks at a website the same way. The journeys are very different. When you look at a website, and since our company builds many websites for clients as part of their marketing, uh, when a client approves their website, they're, they're typically not never gonna look at it the way that uh, one of their potential customers looks at it. They're reading every single page. They're gonna see things that are very redundant and the redundancy is almost gonna be ad nauseum. But from a perspective of a customer or a potential customer, they're not going to, they're not reading the entire website. On average, they're going to visit anywhere from two to four pages. Uh, very rarely will they visit more than that, or very rarely should they visit more than that. If they're visiting, we see people are looking at five, six pages. It's typically a red flag for us to know that the website is hard to use. They can't find what they're looking for. And they were fairly motivated to find it. Otherwise, they would just leave. So these calls to action, whether they be in text as they should be, uh, when you're finishing a sentence or a statement and you believe, okay, at that point, someone may want to, I still have more to say, but maybe give them a choice to make contact here. Break apart content, put a button, or create text that's a little bigger or a little different looking to say, if you, if you know enough right now and you'd like to make contact, click here, or you can keep reading. Uh, as well as uh, calls to action, you'll see sometimes on the right-hand side, you'll see them at the bottom of the page. And I'm a big fan of all of the above. 
uh, the more calls to action, the better, because they should really should be the second bullet point. It should be very hard to miss. And if there's one call to action on a page, it becomes easier to miss. And uh, and right now I'm speaking in terms of um, in terms of a, a horizontal screen. So it's on a desktop, it's very easy to create a lot of calls to action and make them look good because there's a lot of space. But when you start to go into vertical on a mobile device, which uh, you'll be hard pressed to find anybody who at least 50% of their traffic is not coming from a mobile device, it's a lot harder and you have to be, you have to make it very hard to miss on a mobile device without being, um, without getting in the way of the message. So without the communication. So when you're designing a site, you should always look to mobile first. Um, again, vertical versus horizontal, they're very different uh, experiences for a customer and you have to make sure that layout is is clear, concise, easy to use, uh, no matter what they're doing. And if things get confusing, if there's too many images, thin it down, less is more, and, and make it very simple. Um, everything should be aligned to the next logical step so even if you're writing a blog post, what do you expect at the end of that blog post? Was it purely educational? Do we expect people to maybe want more information? We should never leave it up to the user. You should always have what's the goal. Once someone's done reading a piece of content, done looking at a page, done looking at an image, what do we want from them next? Don't leave it up to them to decide what you what they should do. You have to guide them as if you would just speaking to them and you would typically a good salesperson would say, OK, what are our next steps? Where do you want to go from here? Here's here's a couple of options. This is you're not a marketer. This is not a website. This is professional persuasion. We're persuading someone to do a thing. So aligning the next logical step is imperative when you're creating new content, when you're creating a, a post in social, when you're creating anything you should know what you want that person to do and align to the next logical step. Um, and nothing asked that cannot be asked uh, later. What that means is let's not get in the way of conversion. Um, a lot of times when we're doing conversion exercises for clients, so they're coming to us and saying our website gets a lot of people to it, uh, but we get very few leads. Uh, we'll do conversion enhancement um, services for clients. And I, we typically will go right to conversion points. And if a conversion point is a form or the word contact, which it should always be contact, uh, if, if I click on the contact page and there's a, a form and it's a mile long, the first question I ask that person is, what happens when someone fills out this form, hits submit? Um, once it's received on the other end, what happens? And if they say, well, we call that person, I immediately uh, start to whack that form in uh, down to its core necessities. If you're going to call someone then and get more information, then gather as little information up front as possible and gather the get them to call. You want them to engage. If I look at a gigantic form and I've got three minutes left before my, a meeting, I might say, you know what, I'll do this later. And chances are I probably won't. I'll do another search because I'll forget about your brand and I'll probably, if I don't find you, I can find someone else. Uh, we, we get so stringent with these forms that we'll typically never ask for city, state, and zip code, because if we have the zip code, we already have the city and state. It's a little harder for us, but it's a little easier for the client. So nothing, don't ask for anything that you can't ask for later. It just gets in the way of conversion. And Speaking of conversion, you have to know when that happens. So measurements are critical. Everyone needs to become a, a data scientist at this point in the, in the world. Everything runs off of data. And if you don't know how to manage it and you don't know how to engage it and you don't know how to measure things, you don't know what works. And, and even worse, you don't know what doesn't work. So it's, it's important, you know, sometimes marketing is going to work, sometimes it's not. The, the biggest failure, though, is not knowing. Uh, which is good. So your goals and KPIs before going into anything, and especially on the web, whoever's doing your marketing needs to understand from you what your goals are. And then they need to understand what those um, key performance indicators are that align to those goals. Um, and you need to hold them to task as well. If they're If they're showing you KPIs or measurements and you don't 
either don't understand them or don't see how those are helping or informing you or making anything better, ask them, how does that particular measurement, how does that KPI align to my goals as you know them, as I've explained them to you? And if they don't, then we shouldn't measure just because we can measure. We have to make sure that everything we're measuring, the critical elements of measurement are aligned to the goals of the company, of what we're trying to achieve. And these are the things you're trying to achieve typically on, an, on a digital platform and, and probably any type of marketing at this point. There's really no digital or traditional, there's just marketing. Everything is measurable. You're trying to create engagements uh, and it depends on your type of business. You, you may be creating, and we all have to now, you know, uh, post pandemic, uh, is try to create users as well as customers. People that don't buy from you have a tremendous amount of value because they may buy in the future or they may be influencers. So engaging them in many different ways, like opting into information through email, through social, things of that nature. We're trying to measure every type of engagement, every touch point someone could have where there's an opportunity to gather information, uh, whether it's them typing it in, typing in their email address, typing in a form to be contacted later, uh, whether they're clicking like, following us, those are all engagements. What are the engagement points across all of our digital ecosystem? Understanding what they are, getting people to opt into those, getting them to choose that. Uh, getting people to see it is one thing, but getting them to choose it is something else. So getting them to opt in for, even from an email perspective, uh, just a simple, we, we'd love to be able to send you information about whatever the value is that you offer, opt in and uh, connect with that person and turn them into that user where you have permission to market to them. And then ultimately conversions, what is a conversion? It's not one type of thing. A conversion uh, could be filling out a form. It could be clicking the call. Um, on average, our clients tend to have 10 to 20 different conversion points, depending on the type of business that they have. Uh, if it's an e-commerce business, obviously a, a purchase is a conversion, but opting in is a conversion and engagement is a conversion. We have to understand all these conversions and measure them and put ROI in place so we understand where we should be spending money to get which conversions. And sometimes an early conversion leads to a later conversion. So you start to understand that conversions that don't turn into a sale can still lead to a sale. So someone opting into an email marketing, let's say, that isn't a client. Uh, would get a different different message than someone who is a client, and then you're trying to turn that first conversion into a second conversion, uh, and then you'll have different goals and KPIs for email. But primarily, these are the three things that cover everything you can do from a measurement perspective. You're measuring engagements, you're measuring opt-ins, and you're measuring conversions. There's tools out there like Google Data Studio that allow you, and we, we do this with our clients as well, we create custom dashboards that can pull in a lot of different data. Uh, the problem nowadays with data is it's all over the place. It's in this, it is, uh, everything has its own dashboard. Everything has its own information, whether it's Google Analytics that tracks everything that happens on your website, um, whether it's your paid media campaign, which will have more information than analytics, whether it's your social media, which that has its own information about um, that your that analytics won't track unless someone clicks through your website. Uh, so there, there's and then also your CRM and your email marketing and and everything else you could possibly think of all has data. There's ways to unify that data and pull it into bite-sized chunks of information and categorize that information. So in near real time, you can start to see what's actually turning people into interested parties, turning them into customers, turning them into clicks, turning them into traffic across the board. Uh, and it's all it's all customizable and it turns into every and it ties into everything. You can create custom connectors that tie into your CRM so you can actually know the disposition of every lead, where it came from, um, how you first engage with them so you can start to replicate things that that actually start to look more and more like customers. So understanding your data and unifying your data is very important in a conversion environment because you're always course correcting conversion. You can't course correct unless you have that data at your fingertips. And from a business perspective, most people are not Google Analytics uh, experts and they're not data experts. So having custom bite size, easy to understand pieces of information and charts uh, is that tie specifically to your goals allows you to achieve those goals.
whether it's e-commerce or paid search, there's a lot of different dashboards within the tool that you can create. Um, but it's better, faster, and continuous connections equals more revenue. And the using data to make your connections better, make them faster, and continuous connections to the right people, that's all born of data. You, you That's not going to happen out of the gate. It just gets, it can get better and better and better over time as you hone. And as you hone, you're honing toward more revenue. So you can start to see the revenue that's born of marketing. Uh, content, one of the probably most overused words uh, in digital marketing is everyone wants to create content. And the last thing the internet wants is more content uh, from you. It doesn't necessarily need more content. So you have to be very specific on what content means. So everyone says they're doing content marketing. Most people think that just means a, a blog post um, or they're just adding content to their site, but what's coming of it. So content is, is insanely important. And more often than not, it's more important to get your existing web page content correct. Uh, that there's no wasted words. Someone will usually say to me, how many, how much content is too much content? How many words are too many words on our website? Uh, but, you know, or they'll say things like people don't read, um, or I don't think people read. And, and that's just not the case. So people do read. Um, we tend to skim on a website when there's a lot of words, but if it's important to us, we will read if, which means if your writing is not making a connection with that person, they're not gonna read it, they're gonna stop reading it. They're gonna start skimming and then they're gonna leave or, or bounce off of your site or go to the next thing. So, and how many words are too many words or enough words? It's It should be no more or less than it absolutely needs to be. Not one word more or one word less that you believe absolutely needs to be there. If you need to write war and peace to get the point across, then write war and peace. If you can do it in a paragraph and you don't need to do anything more than that, then do it in a paragraph. As long as you believe that no words are wasted and everything there needs to be there and it's written in a way that converts someone. So written in a way that converts someone. So here, here's a, here's an example. So I'm going to, I'm just going to get rid of this slide for a second, give you some context to what you're about to read. Uh, so recently one of the springs on my garage door broke one of my garage doors. Uh, so I came out in the garage and it's, it's just dangling, dangling there and, um, it's uh, 16, 17 years old, knew eventually it would break. So now I have to find someone to fix that. And obviously like everyone else in the world, I go to Google to find that particular service. And I go to a website that shows up and this is what this website says. Um, it says having a working garage door is important. Uh, not that I didn't know that coming in, but uh, they have to tell me that. A garage door is made up of several components that work together for smooth operating. Uh, again, um, I kind of get that and um, mine's not smoothly operating right now because one of the components begins to malfunction that a repair is necessary. The entire first paragraph I know coming in, it's a, it is an insane waste. Uh, and then going into it, this is a homepage of a, of a website, a broken garage door can cause a safety concern. It becomes serious of not taking care of. And this is where we come in. Now I'm on their site already. They're not trying to convince someone that a broken garage door is bad. Uh, someone did a search, went to their website, and the only reason to go to their website for a garage door company is because you need a garage door or you have a question about a garage door. And it's typically not the history of the garage door or, or why it's broken. So I, it was hard to actually find where they wanted me to go to find the information I needed. So they wasted all this time, all these words, when really if I had a, a a paragraph could have done it and a couple of calls, good structured calls to action. If you're looking for a new garage door, if you are looking for an opener, if you have a repair or service, there's only a handful of things I could, anyone could possibly need click here and it would take me right to the thing I needed. And I would have signed up with them. And, and I didn't, I didn't sign up with them for various reasons, this being one of them. But the other is that a lot of people don't read the the content on their website. And, and I know this for a fact because I see it with clients that we work with, uh, where even a year later they go, oh, I was reading this page. Where did that content come from? And it's like, well, you approved it from, from um, a year ago. And I was like, oh, well, I never read it. This is content that is in front of your clients. And there's other companies out there that will 
have your content written in an automated fashion. They will send it out overseas. They will have software do it. It's just about writing the content and getting it on the site. And if you don't read it, you're, you're really doing yourself a huge disservice because it reflects your brand. You have to make sure that there's not saying anything you don't want to say, and they're saying everything that you think needs to be said. And in this particular case, uh, this was the why choose us, which is, which is a critical page for most companies. Like, okay, why do people choose us? This is a great opportunity if someone clicks on that to tell them why. In this particular instance, it's because we honest and experienced, we licensed, bonded, and insured, professional technicians, the first grammatically correct uh, bullet point, by the way, we provide same day service. We accept all types of payments. We have best prices. This was not written by what we don't have is uh, the skill to write very simple text. And this will definitely get someone to leave your website. This is an extreme example, but it's a real example of what happened to me two weeks ago. This is on someone's site. This is what is put forward. This does not scream professional to me. This does not scream attention to detail. This does not, uh, this does not mean that, that I actually matter to you. To get me the right information doesn't matter. So I make some assumptions that, um, and maybe my assumptions are on, on the extreme side, but people make these assumptions every day. And why lose someone uh, on for something so simple because you didn't check out your site? Uh, this is one of our clients. This is something very simple. It, the, this screenshot doesn't do it justice, but because it's a it's a website, but it, it's just a screen. It's not even a screenshot. It's a seg segment of their site. But if you look at how it's structured, there's a heading uh, or a header, a graphical header. Resolute is uh, kind of their mantra. It's their it's their rally cry that they are. That is what their brand promises that they are very resolute, which means admirably purposeful. Determining and unwavering, uh, determ sorry, determined and unwavering, that is what resolute means, and that's what they believe that they are. It doesn't, it's very quick, it's very easy, and then my eyes start to scroll down, and I know exactly what they are. They're an architectural, they offer architectural firm services. That's the page that I'm on. This is not their homepage, this is a subpage. Then there's another heading in a different color. It's the architectural services you're looking for, the outcome you desire is a perfect match. When writing content, we determined what their clients wanted, and it was outcome. When you're hiring an architect, it's not about the beginning stages, it's about the final stage. When, what We want to get to the end. We want whatever it is to be built, and that's what we want. So that content became first and foremost. And we talk a little bit about who they are. There's calls to action in here um, from link text there's calls to action as text at the bottom we invite you to experience our experience i mean they've been around since 1891 so they they do have uh, over a century and a half of experience let's have a quick no risk zero commitment architectural services conversation because that was important too the word quick is operative making sure that people say know that it's going to be quick and then they can there's a button to request a quick consultation very simple for a very complex service and it converts on a very high level because people read it quickly, they don't skim, it's not overwhelming, good calls to action, clear, concise, purposeful, not one wasted word. Um, you have to control the journey, uh, not, this is obviously the band journey, but you have to control the journey no matter where people go. And that means in social, that means on your website, that means in mobile. So when we start to control the journey, there's ways to do this with, with text. When you look at this, uh, and you read it, you'll read it exactly as I determined I wanted you to read it. Uh, so when I mentioned the different headings, different colors, uh, different sizes of fonts, there are ways to control how someone's eyes will go across your website and what you want them to read first, what you want them to read second, third, and then final. Uh, interestingly enough, the thing at the top is the thing you read last uh, because of the size of the font. So, and also that it's that the, the highest contrast is the white and the black. So with content, there's ways to get me to read the thing you want me to read, to get your customers to engage with just simple content, the things you want them to engage with. What do you want them to see first? What's the most important thing that they read first and, and have a reason why, get them to do that. So there's ways to control that and good content writers 
good content designers, good uh, converter, you know, good professional persuaders know how to do this. And this, these are these are all pieces of conversion that are easily done on a website. From an eye tracking perspective, so this will be the single throw website um, in its kind of full form. And that is how someone scans across a website. We start at the top left, we go down to center, we drift over to the right, we go to the left because our eyes scan left and right. And I just realized that I, I don't know how to number things uh, uh, in sequence because it's one, two, three, three. Um, it should be one, two, three, four. Uh, and the fourth piece, the, the final piece is the bottom right. That's where there's something called the scent of a website. It's the reason that mice have scroll wheels on them and you can use gestures to scroll is because there's the scent of a website should pull us down. Uh, we don't look back up, which is why navigation that's sticky at the top as we scroll is very important because our eyes scan left to right, we don't scroll back up. So understanding where someone's eyes work as they kind of zigzag through a website and they end up at the bottom right, it becomes very important what we put where. Um, like I would, what well, you'll notice is there's no circle on the top right. The top right is the coldest spot on a website. You can put almost anything you want there, most people won't find it. That's why people typically put login information there for existing clients, because you're motivated to find it. Uh, where if it were the call to action or a phone number, most people are already scrolling down. They're not scrolling back up. They're not going to find it. And also you notice the words fixed with. No matter, I have a 32 inch screen on my desk, widescreen, uh, it might even be bigger than that. And uh, if, if I allowed my website to fill the screen, it would be, a, the entire website would be a paragraph. Uh, the screen is so large and most people have these large screens when they're on their desktop. So making sure that your web designer is designing to be fixed with allows you to control the journey, uh, which is, in, in, you can't control what people look at when your website is a different size with every single monitor. Then when we get to mobile, which is far more important than desktop, again, it's very easy to design for a desktop. It's very hard to design um, vertically. Uh, for a small screen. So this is Prestige, uh, who's obviously hosting this particular podcast. This is their mobile site, and uh, it's different than their their desktop site because you can have different information on one versus the other because they tend they seem to know that people that are on a mobile device have uh, maybe different timelines. They need to get to things quicker. Uh, their calls to action need to be stronger and up at the top. They don't want to scroll. So they may have different different things, and this is all very possible nowadays. You can have different things on your mobile site versus your desktop site. Once it identifies where you're coming from, you can show something different and different calls to action, different colors, different structures based on the device you're using. So in this particular case, it's very clear, concise content with strong opening headings. Um, it's who I am. And again, if you think back to the uh, Princess Bride example, it's who I am, and it's, so it has the greeting and it, it has the situational relevance. So then it starts to get into it and in very short order, <clears throat> excuse me, there are very clear calls to action. And in this case, is, in this case there are two because it's been determined that at that point, those are the two options that somebody would need. They would either want to, I need this now, get me somebody on the phone, or I'm not convinced, I really do wanna know more. So I wanna take the next step, tell me, tell me more of what I need to know. This is very clear, concise, and it explains what they are and who they are and who they work with. This is a wonderful model for how a mobile site should function that is designed to convert and engage with specific people. So it, aligning the experience is important as well. So increasing brand value means creating better customer experiences. And um, I'm going to give you an example. My company is industry agnostic. We work in a lot of different industries. We have some specialties, uh, concentrations, uh, so to speak. One is healthcare. This is a, a hospital that is very close to my house, um, you know, within a couple of miles of my home. So it's my local hospital, so to speak. And uh, I get a lot of information from them. And one of the pieces of information they sent out is they have a, a new mammogram technology. And uh, that mammogram technology came out in a, in a public release and it's 3D mammography in the newly remodeled Women's Health Center. Now, I've never had a mammogram, but I, uh, from what I hear, uh, and I've, I hear often, it's not the, uh, the, the most fun and pleasant experience. It's not something someone typically will look forward to, to doing. And when I look at this and I read 3D mammography, I think 
high tech, something new, different, maybe a better experience. And then I see newly remodeled women's health center. But when I look at the website that this is on, it seems very sterile to me. There's nothing exciting about it. It's almost, I don't want to read it because it's so text heavy. Um, there's, there's just nothing, nothing appealing to it at all. And from a hospital perspective, being uh, sterile is a good thing, but from a content perspective, when you're trying to really connect with someone, you know, there had to be a reason that you offer this new technology and remodel the women's health center, but you didn't remodel the way that you engage me and you're trying to engage me to, to, as a new customer. Now, the way that this is done right, that I've seen it done right is a, is a company in Long Island that's really doing the same service called Pure Mammography. Right off the bat, their logo is a little more appealing. Now, that's kind of forgivable. Your logo is your logo, and Center State is a is a full hospital. They're not going to change that. But the, they've chosen the right colors that are, uh, you know, the kind of the lavender color. So it's calming. It makes sense. There's this is a this is a good logo to do the thing that they do. Um, when I look at their site, it is very different. There's a lot of content, but it's broken out the right way. It's broken out with words and bold. It's broken out with with headings that I can, at a glance, see what I want to and jump right down to. There's not pictures of cold, sterile things. It's it's a woman in a bathrobe in a spa-like experience, and that's how they explain it. Spa-like, painless mammogram experience on Long Island. We know where they are. We know what what it's like. We know that this is perceivably something different because it looks different than any other site I've been to that explains these services. So even when we talked about going to their Google My Business page, oh, sorry, let me go. Uh, yep. So their Google My Business page is nice. It has a good feel to it. There's a tremendous amount of reviews there. They're positive reviews. I mean, 4.9 for oh, almost 340 Google reviews, that's fantastic. Um, you know, they're taking full advantage of the Google My Business page. The imagery they chose is right. The, the, even even the angles of imagery from you know top down for the machine itself um, gives it a smaller look. Uh, the colors they use, everything is just done right. They they they've controlled the journey. They've controlled the experience. And um, they close at 9 p.m. And they just they've, they've done they've done a very good job. Now, when I look at Central State Healthcare Systems, it again it's the same exact thing. Now they have four Google reviews. They have a five, but it's only four reviews. Where I'll take a 4.9 for hundreds of reviews as opposed to four people saying I like it. They've taken a completely different. They close at five. Um, they the pictures they chose are. Um, Arval, it's the waiting room. I'm not sure that that makes me choose anything, that that wooden round table or the two-tone wood floor is going to make me want to go there. Uh, they've chosen another image of a chair inside of a, the room itself. Um, I don't get it. And uh, the picture of the mammography machine in general, did, I'm, I'm curious if they asked the photographer to take the most ominous viewpoint possible. Give me the bottom up to make this thing look, this six foot tall machine look 12 feet tall. Everything here is done wrong. Everything here stops me from choosing them over someone else because they didn't control the journey. They didn't control the experience. They didn't think about who is engaging. This is just a big hospital doing what a big hospital does and saying, okay, check it off the list because it's been done and losing business to other companies that will pay more attention to the experience. Uh, to, to quote the poet's gib, uh, you've got to give a little more than you're asking for if you're going to win and convert people in this very aggressive market that we're in. It is everyone is a digital consumer. Everyone gets to see everything. And you have to also look at what your customers are looking at when they're not looking at you and making sure it's not better than you. Um, one of my favorite quotes, JP Morgan, you can't pick cherries with your back to the tree. I don't really care that you have a website. I don't care that you're doing digital marketing just because you're just because you're in the meadow doesn't mean you're ready to, to, to benefit from what's on the tree. You have to actively go after it. You, just being there is not enough, especially in this day and age when everyone is, is well uh, indoctrinated to digital means and, and their expectations are very, very high. 
that's my presentation. That's the the uh, topic that I was asked to speak on. Uh, hopefully, it was helpful, and um, Prestige can help us with the next steps here. So, thank you for your time. Larry, thank you so much for your time and insight today. Um, we are really lucky to have gotten like such an in-depth but clear understanding of how a lot of this content marketing works. So again, thank you so much. Um, we are so appreciative of this. Well, thank you very much. And if anyone has any questions or reaches out to both uh, Prestige or myself, uh, Prestige is a, a tremendous, I, mean, I know their organization very well. Uh, I know that their website is e extremely content rich and uh, connected with the services that they offer, and they also have podcasts and things of that nature, and um, you know, very good insights and in social. They do a, a, an incredibly good job uh, doing the thing that they do and providing value even beyond the service that they offer. And I think this is a perfect example of of that. Uh, so um, obviously, look at all the things that are on this page. There's a if you're if you're in business in any in any aspect, there's a lot of great information that I know I benefited from that are on the resources on this page. That's awesome. So Larry, we have a couple questions that came through the chat. Um, sure. We'll connect on these items, but there is one that came through that's pretty interesting. Um, we could always connect afterwards um, and get back, but if we have a question regarding website effectiveness. Um, you put a lot of emphasis on that. Is there a foolproof way or kind of tool out there to help our clients test that? So website effectiveness is is a uh, it's a tough one because the, there's a lot of there's a lot of tools out there that will help you test that, but I don't know that they're much help to be honest with you because most of those tools treat every website the same. So let let's take the Prestige PEO website. So if you go to that website and Prestige puts it through one of these tools, it treats their service, which is a complex service, nuanced, uh, a lot of information, a lot of different types of of potential clients and people coming for different reasons. The, the tool will treat the PEO, the Prestige PEO website, the same as the Three Brothers Pizzeria website or the Dry Cleaner website. It looks for certain elements. Now, the only time it's it, that just doesn't make any sense. You're, you're going to engage people differently. Um, and and again, if you if you put yourself up against Amazon, Amazon is not a well-designed site, but it loads fast. It's structured well and mobile. Uh, it does all the right things for Amazon, but that wouldn't help Prestige PEO. So the only tool out there that I know of that I think is helpful across any website are speed testing tools. Uh, so if you if you go to Google and you Google Google website speed test, um, you'll find you know you're gonna you have to have a website speed test because otherwise if you just do speed testing, you'll find things that test your internet connection. So it's it's really about testing your website and you'll be able to to cut and paste your URL into the tool, hit a button, and it, it starts to tell you what. Uh, it gives you a lot of information, like first contextual paint, first click, uh, first engagement points, all of those things. That's the only tool I would personally use to determine if the web, if Google deems the website slow or fast, both in mobile, it shows you both mobile and desktop. It doesn't tell the full story. It has to be interpreted. Um, not all bad scores are going to stop you from showing up in Google, but it's a, it, that's the only tool I think we're looking at everything the same way makes sense because people don't change that three second rule doesn't change if I'm if I'm going to buy a pizza or I'm going or I'm looking for uh, PEO services it doesn't change you know people have their behaviors they hit the back button just as quick no matter what they're looking at other than that making a website effective is is really finding a company that really can understand and even look through no one can look at your website and say what's effective and not without asking questions without understanding who your potential customers are uh, without, and if people aren't asking you these types of questions, you have to question them on, well, how would you know if you don't know what the website's intended to do? How do you know I have too much content or not enough content or saying the right things or the wrong things or have strong calls to action? You really need someone that, that asks those questions, understands things from a sales perspective, knows what the outcome is, and also can analyze data, can look at your website and say, this is working fine. Uh, whether I like something or not, before I say we should get rid of it, I always look at the data. So I always look and see, well, you know what? This has a very high engagement. People are converting here. This page at first glance, I didn't like, but that's a subjective decision. It seems to be making sense. Let's try to make it a little bit better. 
So um, again, from an effectiveness perspective and meaning how, how well does something convert, I think you need a human insight. Uh, how well a site functions from a load perspective, that can be done with software. Awesome. Thank you so much. So, Larry, I'll be sharing with you the Q and A. Uh, you actually have Excellent. access to it now. If you want to jump over there, just from um, the kind of navigation bar at the top, for those of you who have asked questions, um, we will do what we can to get back to you. If not now, then we will follow up with you after. So, again, Larry, thank you so much, and to all of our listeners, thank you again for giving us your time on these Wednesday mornings. Um, our goal here is to provide as much powerful content to help you and your business navigate the future and continue to grow. So, as usual, this will be saved and posted on our website, prestigepeo.com, along with the slide deck. Um, so, you'll be able to kind of take Larry's information with you and apply it to your business moving forward. And please check out our blog, the Prestige, the Prestige Perspective at prestigepeo.com forward slash blogs. And as usual, we love your insight. So if there are any more um, bits and tidbits and pieces of information that you are concerned about or that you're curious about or that you would just love to see some of this content boost around, please let us know. Our goal is to make sure this is as relevant and useful to you as possible. So please do not hesitate to reach out to your service team or anybody that you would like to contact here. So with that, thank you so much again. And Larry, thank you again. Um, hopefully we'll be able to have you on again in the future. My pleasure. Thank you so much.